Whenever we talk about exercise in the brain, we always have to start talking about cognitive aging, especially. Um, most of the work on exercise in the brain actually uh, is really in the context of late adulthood. Across numerous cognitive domains, we see a relative stability in cognitive performance, maybe up until around the age of 60. Some argue uh, uh, younger than that is when we start to see some cognitive changes. But across most or many different cognitive domains, we see some gradual decline. Let's take this person right here. This person is about a 70-year-old individual. But if you look at the size of the prefrontal cortex, they actually have the size of the prefrontal cortex equivalent to somebody much, much younger, about 25 years of age. This person, who's about the same age, actually has the size of the prefrontal cortex equivalent to somebody about 25 years older, almost 100 years old. So this is a significant amount of individual variability. What factors contribute to this type of variability? So this is really where exercise emerges onto the scene as a possible way of not only preventing decline, but also uh, influencing and, and actually improving and, and altering the rate of, of decline. Thinking about cognitive aging, instead of thinking about it as this deterioration and downward trajectory, we're thinking about it as in a way that is more promising and more of an optimistic approach that we can modify the trajectory. For some reason, executive functions seem to be more sensitive to exercise. We have observational studies showing that if you engage in greater amounts of physical activity earlier in the lifespan, you show a reduced risk of developing numerous neurological conditions later in life, including Alzheimer's disease. When we talk about fitness, we can actually talk about it in numerous ways. Um, flexibility and balance are types of, of fitness. S muscle strength is a type of fitness. But also, there's also lung capacity, your ability to, your aerobic capacity. If we do a randomized clinical trial in which we experimentally manipulate exercise behaviors, show changes in cardiorespiratory fitness, can we actually modify the size of the hippocampus? So we bring in older, relatively sedentary adults into the laboratory. We do baseline assessments. We randomize them to one of two conditions. The two conditions are really important. So we have either a brisk walking group or more of a stretching group. They both come in for the same amount of time. So they're, they're getting the same amount of social engagement. They're getting the same amount of health instruction. They come in for the same number of days per week. So the main differences here are the, are the intensity and type of physical activity. We do that for six months or one year, and then we do all of the follow-up assessments that we did at baseline. We reliably improved fitness levels in our walking exercise group. There's a couple of really important messages that came from this paper. The older adult brain retains its capacity for plasticity. And only 12 months of moderate intensity exercise was able to modify the size of the structure that typically deteriorates in late adulthood and that is predictive of onset of memory problems and Alzheimer's disease. Well, what's happening to memory? Because the hippocampus is, is really involved in memory formation. So what's happening to memory? So there have been a lot of studies, randomized clinical trials, examining the impact of exercise on episodic memory performance. Something really remarkable here. It shows you the growth of this, of this literature and, and, and the interest in this area. Look across, look down this column here where it shows p-value. Do you see many that are significant, that are less than p, p less than 0.05? Not many, meaning a lot of individual studies do not show significant effects. However, when you pool across all of these studies, you do see a significant effect. Based on this effect size and based on the variability, all of these studies have sample sizes that are way too small. So you only really can detect the effect when you pool across all of these studies. The level that is often ignored. Exercise is a great way to get people to sleep better. So maybe, Sleep is the pathway. Maybe sleep is the key. If we modify sleep, then we have better memory function. So exercise is improving memory function because it's improving sleep. Sleep would then be the mediator. Sleep would be the mechanism. In this one study published by our group in 2017, 
We, we analyzed data from 149 people that were part of an, an observational longitudinal study. And what we found was that physical activity was associated with a reduced risk of cognitive impairment 13 years later. This is consistent with a lot of other research. But then what we found was that this nine-year measurement of amyloid was actually statistically mediating this association, suggesting that physical activity-induced changes in amyloid might be mediating the cognitive risks for cognitive impairment. So is this, how accurate is this? Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to really hold up. We recently conducted the systematic review and meta-analysis on physical activity in amyloid beta in middle-aged and older adults, and this literature is really a mess. I, there's no, I have no confidence at all that physical activity is actually associated with any reduction in, in Alzheimer's disease pathology. I don't think physical activity is reducing risk for Alzheimer's disease because it's influencing Alzheimer's disease pathology. I think it's acting through other pathways. So um, we have other moderating factors that we could consider. We're starting to understand some of these moderating factors. And one of them appears to be APOE genotype, so the genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Here what you see is um, people who have low amounts of physical activity versus people that have high amounts. And these are people that do not carry the, the uh, genetic risk allele versus people who do carry the genetic risk allele. The, the um, bar that jumps off the screen at you is this one, right? Low amounts of physical activity and carrying the genetic risk allele. They have high amounts of amyloid in their brain. But what I'm most interested in are these guys right here. These guys have a genetic risk for high amounts of amyloid. What the, the main difference is that they're getting high amounts of physical activity. High amounts of physical activity seems to be completely mitigating the genetic risk for having high amyloid. This was the Physical Activity Guidelines for Americans published in 2018. So I'm very excited. I don't want to just keep these studies and this research in the laboratory setting. I want to make sure that people understand the importance and impact that physical activity can have on enhancing and maintaining brain function throughout the lifespan. And by the way, this, was, um, this 2018 guidelines were reviewed um, and published in 2019. So in conclusion, exercise has widespread effects on the brain. That being said, there seems to be some regional specificity. Notice I kept bringing up the hippocampus. If you look across the literature, the hippocampus keeps coming up in these studies over and over and over again. Why is there regional specificity? We don't really have a good grasp or good understanding of that just yet. We still have a poor understanding of the mechanisms. We're starting to get there with larger sample sizes, harmonization across groups that are doing these studies so we can pool data, pool effect sizes, and better understand pathways. Understanding heterogeneity of response and individual differences remains a major gap. One of the problems and one of the reasons why it is still a gap is that you need large sample sizes to actually better understand individual differences. In most studies, they don't have the sample sizes to really examine individual differences. IGNITE was designed to try to address some of those individual differences. And exercise may have long-term health consequences for many diseases that affect the brain, not just diseases of the brain. 